scary. Hello, what's the crap? What's the story? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're checking out clan members reacting to life sentences. Ooh, let's go. Prepare yourself for an emotional roller coaster as we take a deep dive into a moment that will leave you speechless. Okay. In today's video, you're going to witness how the lives of these once feared individuals come crashing down when they face the ultimate consequence of their actions. So grab your popcorn, buckle up, and join us for this unbelievable journey where justice finally prevails. Come on. Have you ever witnessed a person humiliatingly create a spectacle and completely lose control in a public setting? Indeed, at times, such occurrences can escalate into disaster, as exemplified by Jeremy Christian. This individual elevates the irritation of mortifying public commotions to an unprecedented degree. However, this wasn't merely a dispute over a supermarket bill. In May 2017, Christian found himself on a public train in Portland, Oregon, where he revealed his authentic, prejudiced nature. The train, akin to most urban centers, encompassed a diverse crowd with travelers of varying ethnicities and faiths. Seemingly, this provoked Christian into a wild tirade. He commenced ranting, denigrating, and even issuing lethal threats, undeniably racially motivated. In an endeavor to protect their co-passengers, two individuals, Taliesin Mirden Namkai Meshe, and Micah David Cole Fletcher, intervened to confront Christian about his belligerent and bigoted conduct. In a terrifying twist, after some exchange, Christian produced a knife and attacked Micah and another traveler named Ricky Best. The sight of the appalling atrocity was starting as Christian absconded as though nothing transpired, as if he hadn't just snuffed out the lies of two blameless individuals due to his warped racism. Three years subsequent, Christian's trial eventually commenced, and as with most murders and bigots, a plethora of sordid details emerged. The case involved testimonies from over 40 witnesses. Do you know how crazy that is? Just normal people doing normal things. I get on the train every time. F they just stand. Oh my god. They were trying to stand up for the geezer that was getting abused. Fuck. That's scary. Along with other accusations, such as assaulting a black woman's eye with a Gatorade bottle and another teenage girl, one wearing a hijab. Regarding the train episode, law enforcement and the judiciary were inundated. Christian faced charges including two counts of murder, one count of attempted murder, two counts of second-degree intimidation, three misdemeanors, and one count of possessing a restricted weapon. Christian's offenses were so appalling that one survivor of the trio of assaults, Micah Cole Fletcher, described the challenge of sleep accompanied wow. by nightmares, including one in which he found himself in a tunnel, progressively filling with blood until he suffocated. Reckoning loomed for Christian as he was handed two life sentences without the possibility of parole plus an additional 51 years for his other transgressions. What is high school in Oregon? Where I'm from, we defend ourselves. One might assume this would suffice for him to moderate and reevaluate his decisions, but killers of his ilk typically lack rationality. As he launched into a further diatribe within the courtroom against one of his victims, brazenly threatening to end her life in the presence of all, it's likely justifiable to presume that no one harbored a shred of remorse for his retribution. Case 2. Portland experienced not merely one but two appalling homicides on our list, with the second involving Russell Courtier. Genuine fiends like Courtier are unveiled to the public when a trivial dispute escalates into a heinous killing. It commenced when a spontaneous altercation erupted outside a 7-Eleven between Courtier and another individual, Larnell Bruce Jr. This wasn't your ordinary street quarrel, however, as surveillance cameras captured Courtier abruptly pursuing Larnell Bruce in a jeep and savagely running him down, resulting in his death. We might never ascertain the actual catalyst for this confrontation, but we possess a reasonably solid notion of Courtier's motive. As it emerged, he was affiliated with a white supremacist prison faction named European Kindred. He donned the organization's emblem on his hat. Do you know how crazy it is for you to run someone down with a car? Like, you literally get in your car, close the door, whether you're gonna put your seatbelt on, I'm not sure. And then run, like, you're, like, you're not in danger. You're not, they're literally running away from you and you're chasing. Prof. That's hate. And even had it tattooed on his leg, signifying an entirely new degree of perverse allegiance to something so atrocious. Following the discovery of his cap at the crime scene and CCTV cameras capturing him in the act, he faced charges of first-degree murder. His girlfriend, Colleen Hunt, who was egging him on in the car, her vehicle instead, 
to run over Bruce was indicted for first degree manslaughter. We the jury find the defendant as not one murder guilty, second degree guilty. Cortier established a milestone as Oregon's inaugural hate crime conviction in 30 years and was handed a life sentence with no prospect of liberation for 28 years. Life imprisonment represents the utmost penalty a murderer can receive, but it likely doesn't suffice for Lionel Bruce's mother, who addressed Cortier with the following words. You permitted evil to mislead you and extinguish the existence of such a lovely and cheering spirit. You seized that life from us. The next case we'll discuss has a profound impact on America, and the perpetrator was none other than Edgar Ray Killen. Now, you might be fooled by his harmless appearance, a frail man with an oxygen tube. However, as the saying goes, looks can be deceiving. The incident occurred in Philadelphia, Mississippi, in 1964, but it wasn't resolved until 2005. Killen was a sawmill operator and part-time Baptist minister, which may appear unremarkable. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner were three of his victims. They were pulled over for speeding one night and jailed, but were later released into the hands of Killen, who murdered them. The case became known as Mississippi Burning after their bodies were found and their station wagon was discovered burning. At the time, Killen was suspected, but due to his good reputation as a preacher, he was released. In 2005, the case was reopened when a former gay errand boy named Mike Hatcher testified that Killen bragged to him about the three murders. Although he was 80 years old at the time, Killen was charged with manslaughter instead of murder and stood trial for seven days. It's a sense of this court that you served 20 years in the custody of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. A total of 60 years behind bars was handed to Killen, allocating 20 years for each act of manslaughter. It's not fair. Like, he's about to die, obviously. Like, he took their lives when they saw young... Like, people like this, man, they deserve... Oh, my God. Why did it take so long for them to... And the fact that they knew, they knew he did it. Like, 40, more than 40 years ago. I'll just, I'll keep quiet because I just said something now. Yet, Killen's fate remained unfulfilled as he passed away at the age of 92 in 2018 while serving his sentence within a Mississippi state penitentiary. Regrettably, our world is plagued by an excessive number of racist perpetrators of murder. Following this is the prejudiced trio of Travis McMichael, Gregory McMichael, and William Bryan. During a bright day in February 2020 in Glynn County, Georgia, these three perpetrators distorted a variant of the law into their own grasp upon observing Ahmed Aubrey jogging tranquilly. Greg McMichael, a Glenn County law enforcement officer and inquirer for the Brunswick Legal Circuit District Attorney's Bureau, and his offspring at that instant deemed that Ahmed was a suspect in neighborhood thefts. Consequently, rather than pursuing the reasonable course of lodging an inquiry, or even merely engaging him, the trio climbed into a vehicle and dismissed all logic, retrieving a 357 Magnum revolver and a 12-gauge shotgun and proceeding straight towards Aubrey. Aubrey was hit thrice by the shotgun belonging to Gregory's child, Travis McMichael. Officers reached the site promptly, but fortune's favor accompanied the trio as they persistently avoided arrest due to a dearth of probable cause. Numerous district attorneys withdrew from the matter since Greg McMichael had been a member of their team. Nonetheless, once Aubrey was absolved of any theft allegations, the three individuals re-entered the realm of suspicion with a video recorded by William Bryan, illustrating the conflict between Travis McMichael and Ahmed Aubrey moments before his slaying. One could argue that Bryan inadvertently undermined his own position and that a Just going for a jog. Do you know what? It's so scary because this is what I do. Sometimes I... I feel like I like to walk out, you know, at like weird times, like early in the morning or late at night. Do you know how scary that is? You just going for a jog. Just jogging. You get killed for that. Out of his associates, as his filmmaking aspirations ultimately led to their confinement. The trio faced prosecution and, unsurprisingly, the verdict determined the assault was driven by racial motives. All three individuals were sentenced to life imprisonment for felony murder and aggravated assault, with Travis additionally charged with malice murder. Through a decisive legal blow, both Travis and Greg were denied the possibility of parole, in contrast to William Bryan, who was granted an opportunity after 30 years. Considering he is currently in his 50s, it's dubious he would accept such an offer when he reaches that advanced age. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, guilty. Admittedly, it's challenging to discern. 
It's this guy. I remember the face now. I remember this face. This was big during Black Lives Matter, wasn't it? I remember this face so much. I just didn't know his name. Turn a positive aspect in the unwarranted demise of the 25 year old. Nevertheless, 25. the case prompted the establishment of hate crime laws in Georgia, ensuring that Ahmed's death was not entirely in vain. As this legal measure will safeguard others from encountering a similarly regrettable and heartbreaking destiny. That was. That was scary. I didn't think that was gonna get to me as it did, but fucking hell. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye bye.